to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work. Both of these are crucial to our success. And now, I would like to introduce today's presenters from the Ohio State University Libraries. Morag Boyd, Acquisitions and Discovery Strategist, Kate Petroskis, Archival Description and Access Unit Lead, Russell Shelby, Lead, Applications Development. Welcome. We're looking forward to learning from you today, and I'm going to hand things off to Morag to get us started. Uh, or I will be. <laughs> I don't have the ball yet. Okay, good morning. This is Morag Boy. Can you hear me? Just want to get a confirmation, quick confirmation. Yes, you sound great, Morag. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, so I'm here to kind of kick things off about managing um, technical services using um, agile methods. And the origins for this really go back here at OSU Libraries, which I may refer to as OSUL from time to time, um, to 2011, um, where um, we created a new strategic plan that really put an emphasis on the discoverability and making special collections available for use. Um, we do have seven special collections in three different buildings, and each of them was responsible for their own archival processing. Um, so as a result of this plan, we decided to create one central processing program that was intended to really support achievement of our objectives, and Kate was hired in 2013 to establish the program. We had some pretty ambitious goals in front of us. Um, the Associate Director for Special Collections um, at that time challenged us to have all collections discoverable by researchers online without staff intervention. And this was a big change from the state that we were in. The University Archivist kind of exclaimed that's like more than 90% of their collections did not achieve this goal. Um, so in order to get there, we realized we had to really uh, consolidate into one tool set that everybody used. And um, in addition, we had some um, digital initiative principles, which really meant that we had to be standards-based, interoperable, and systems agnostic. Another big part of this was setting the goal of minimum description for all held collections deprioritizing deep work on individual collections until we got there. Of course, we still did do some of that, <clears throat> which we really felt was an achievement of MPL principles, so more product, less process. Uh, moreover, we really needed to have intellectual and physical control to better manage our collections from the administrative work of accessioning to uh, making the most effective use of the limited space that we have here at our libraries, as I'm sure we all do. Um, so, the gap was pretty significant um, between our desired future state and where we were. Um, so some particular challenges were a legacy of decentralized um, artifact and archival ma um, collection management, which meant a wide variety of tools and standards of practices. Within the seven units, there was usually more than one tool being utilized, and we had a lot of data that had not previously been publicly accessible despite being in some kind of system. Uh, we also had a new program that had to balance the needs of more about 12 curators and the seven collection areas, which really weren't used to kind of sharing a resource. We had many unprocessed collections and a high volume of collecting, so there was a lot going on. But we decided that wasn't enough. We were going to um, also implement an off-site storage facility, which meant moving about 20,000 cubic feet of materials, which, of course, uncovered a lot more projects to do, as we didn't necessarily have the basic intellectual and physical control over those materials. And needless to say, we did not have the people, skills, money, or time to do all of this in um, you know, the, our traditional methods. All right, so this is Kate. 
Um, archival Description and Access is a centralized unit responsible for managing and performing a broad range of traditional archival technical services work, which I have listed here. As a centralized unit, we do these tasks comprehensively for all seven of the Special Collections units at OSU Libraries, but we are organizationally separate from them. We're not members of their units, and they're not members of ours. Because each of the seven Special Collections units have had separation from each other in OSUL past, when any of them had a history of doing their own archival technical services work before my unit was created, each was doing these tasks following their own guidelines. In order for archival description and access to operate efficiently, we're working to bring organizational standardization to common work that needs to be done for all units. However, fully formed and implemented standardization is an ongoing process. As well, there are some historical differences among the seven units practices that are important to maintain. The work my unit is responsible for is one side of the story. The other side is what staffing and other resources have looked like in the unit over time. Archival Description and Access is an evolving unit that was established when my position was created six years ago, with staffing additions to the unit coming largely to support the expanding responsibilities of the unit. The unit has been staffed by as few as one person and as many as 11 over the past six years, and many of these have been termed positions. The start and end dates of the term positions have overlapped in a way that meant the unit has rarely had two consecutive months with the same staffing configuration in the past four years. Additionally, some permanent positions have been added to the unit in the past three years, further increasing the fluctuating population of the unit. For nearly all of these term positions, and also several of the permanent ones, folks were joining our unit as their first professional position. All had had archival student jobs, internships, volunteer work, et cetera, that gave them some experience and exposure to the work our unit is responsible for, but comprehensive training and skill building has always needed to be a component factored into the completion of all of the work that our unit does. Our unit's work could not successfully be completed without the support of a number of student employees, both undergraduate and graduate, and we are also nearly always hosting at least one intern at the high school, undergraduate, and or graduate level. We rarely have fewer than seven or eight students and interns working in our unit, and at our busiest, we've had as many as 19. To some of you, this may sound collectively like a lot of people working on arch archival technical services work at the same time. Really, 20 or more? How could that not be enough? But it's not, when all of the responsibilities on the previous slide need to be done collectively for our seven partner special collections units. We've yet to have a month in my unit where we get caught up with the work in our queues and backlog. I imagine that whatever the size of your own unit and whatever amount of responsibilities your unit has, if you're responsible for archival technical services, you can relate to this. So as we get into talking about Agile, one thing that is important to note is that Agile doesn't work for us just because we're big or just because we're complex. Agile is extremely scalable and flexible, and if you share the same reality of having more work to do than folks to do it, Agile can work for you. The formula that led me to explore Agile with my colleagues in IT was simple. I needed an effective way to keep track of and prioritize all of the work our special collections unit partners were looking for us to do, make sure to also keep space for internal unit priorities, such as staff training and development, establishing standardized policies, et cetera, and figure out how to most efficiently do both with a staffing configuration that was constantly in flux. And because I knew we absolutely couldn't do everything, i.e. ever get caught up, I needed a solution that was going to make sure we were spending the time we do have on what is most important at any particular time. Russell here. Um, so application development and archival description already had an ongoing dialogue from some application implementation projects. So as we discussed our challenges our teams were having, we started to find lots of similarities in the two team situations. So the project versus maintenance dichotomy. So we want you to build a room reservation system, but we also, we also need to add this login and, and update that software and, and change this other header graphic. Sounds a lot like. Process this 300 foot collection, but also accession this donation and, and fix that finding aid and order some new archival supplies. So, we also have disparate clients who aren't necessarily concerned with what other folks have asked for. We have changing priorities because both teams are in similar service positions in the libraries, so we have to respond to the organizational, the changes in organizational priorities. We both have large, large backlogs. Job security, yes, 
but it's a customer challenge also, yes. So the big one is uncertain effort. So in IT, troubleshooting and development, 20% uh, of the problems take up to 80% of the time, and you usually don't know which 20% it's going to be. In Arcwell description, I am led to understand that you never really know what you're going to find when you open a box. Our applications development team has spent years experimenting with various agile methodologies to help us overcome these challenges. The Oracle description team was interested in how they might translate to their workflows. We don't, we absolutely don't have time to teach you agile methodology, but we can give you the flavor. Agile was developed by software teams to plan just enough work to meet the next set of requirements. Compare this to Waterfall, where you plan every single feature of a project, how much time each action will take, who will do it, which is great for buildings, but not necessarily for software. So some terminology. Um, sprints are a limited period of work. We favor two-week sprints, shorter, shorter periods, and your meeting to work ratio becomes unfavorable. Longer periods, and you're planning work that might not be important then, less agile and more waterfall. For projects with multiple actors, I favor planning sprint work with the scrum method. This involves the group deciding what work they can do in the next sprint. For large queues of tasks, related or unrelated, I favor Kanban. This involves the group organizing the tasks into queues by priority. The more valuable, the higher on the list. The work proceeds by selecting the most important ticket and working on it until it's done or you're unable to do more. So <clears throat> some roles and what we call them in our different departments. The scrum master or leader of board leaders leads the entire agile workflow process. The service owner, or board leader, leads the organization of the tickets for a set of work. The product owner, or stakeholders, are people who help decide importance of the task, frequently <coughs> from outside the team. When we decided to start preparing the ADNA team in 2017, we, did, we committed to a day-long training session in scrum planning. To give us a generic and common metaphor, we decided to have our project be baking 15 cakes. This including planning types, flavors, sizes, baking, decorating, and transportation. I know that several of the staff have professional experience baking cakes. No. It unexpectedly complicated my clever metaphor, but we were still able to work through an entire sprint planning session, simulate a cake baking project, and were able to demonstrate how the team could use these techniques in planning and processing, planning a processing or rehousing project. This training session was enough to get the ADNA team started on their journey. I helped set up their project management software, offered the occasional advice, but primarily they worked through the process as a team. So why is Agile a good fit for Archival Technical Services work? So going back to our mutual challenge of having more work to do than resources or time to complete it in, I was quickly able to see the connections between the goals and purposes of Agile and the realities surrounding work in my unit. First, our colleagues in the Special Collections Unit each have priorities for work they want our unit to do. It's important that my unit finds a way to work on at least something for each of the units as often as we can, but there are times when one unit's priorities are, more, are most important to focus on. Similarly, there are times when focusing on one type of work is more important than making sure we're doing a little bit of everything. Often, though, we are able to fit the requested priorities into a normal balanced workload where we're simultaneously doing a little bit of all the tech services things for all of the special collections units. But because priorities fluctuate, the ability to flexibly respond to what is important to our colleagues that month is critically important to operations in my unit. Uh, second, Agile is all about flexibly adapting to the circumstances at hand. I found that to operationalize this flexibility, boundaries around positions and who does what are only so useful. Knowledge and expertise in any particular area of archival work is certainly beneficial, but a team of specialists who each are the only person who can do any particular type of work limits how successfully they can respond to fluctuations in priorities. So for example, if I start the month with three FTE of accessioning that needs to be done, but only one person who knows how to do accessioning, there's nothing I can do to change that outcome. Two FTE of accessioning will not get done that month. Maybe it's all right that that two FTE of work goes into the backlog. But if clearing that three FTE of accessioning was my unit's highest priority that month, then that's what we need to do. To accomplish this, Agile values assigning people to work instead of work to people. 
So in this scenario, I would identify three FTE of staffing in my unit who can do accessioning to make sure that priority is met rather than assigning all of the accessioning work to the one person who does accessioning because that's what their specific role is. Certainly, in most circumstances, it's ineffective for everyone involved in tech services work to know how to do everything everyone else is doing, but at operational minimum, there should be nothing that only one person knows how to do. Third, Agile is meant to be participatory and is teamwork driven. Decisions about priorities should be made by working with stakeholders, and the actual doing of work in an Agile environment is driven by the Agile team determining together how to meet those priorities. In my unit, every staff member does have one or more areas of technical services work defined in their position description as what they focus on. And when the priorities requested by our colleagues fall in their primary area and are within their capacity, that staff, that staff member is the one who takes on the work. But when the priorities exceed that person's capacity, the team works together to determine how to best collectively distribute their time and skills over the surplus work to ensure that it gets done. The only obstacle the team is really left with is over committing to what they can accomplish together. Finally, work done through the Agile process is meant to be done incrementally, delivering finished work back to stakeholders as soon as there is a minimum viable product, i.e. as soon as it's good enough, knowing that the work can always be returned to later for incremental improvements if those improvements remain a priority for the stakeholder in the future. Translating this to Arcful technical services work, this doesn't mean that we still don't do work that is arguably sound, but it does mean that we will default to doing the least amount of work any given project or collection needs to be usable for our special collections colleagues and patrons. So for example, creating a preliminary inventory reflecting the contents of the collection as found currently is preferable to full Arcful arrangement and description unless or until our special collections colleagues ask for full processing. So this sounds a lot like MPLP, right? Agile in operation is the workflow realization of how MPLP encourages archivists to take on the common problem of more work than people. So switching from concepts to practice, what did setting up and running Agile look like in my unit? Just a note here that there's not time in this webinar to go beyond high level. So if you're interested in a deeper dive into the nuts and bolts of how we ran this operationally, please do feel free to contact me after the webinar. The most important step in setting up Agile was to fit it around everything we're already doing in the way we're already doing it. We had a pretty good workflow in place and clear definitions of what the successful end product of each of these workflows should look like. So in short, we needed to be able to keep everything archival about our work the way it already was. And for Agile to be an effective tool for us, it needed to not disrupt anything archival about our work. Beyond that, though, the rest was really up to us. We looked for other Archival programs running successful Agile operations and didn't find much to go on. But I will note, if this is you, we also would like you to contact us. We'd love to compare notes at this point. So we started with Scrum. This involved everyone collecting all of their lists and spreadsheets of, and post-its, et cetera, of work that needed to be done and turning each one into one ticket that was entered in JIRA, which was our project management software that we used and which Russell will talk a little bit more about later. We did not try to capture every possible project and collection we might ever need to work on, only what we had in our current lists or current queues. And at this point, we ended up with about 700 tickets. We liked the idea of organizing our work into two week sprints, meaning that we could come together as a unit every two weeks to review priorities, which were now tickets, and, and collectively determine what to work on over the coming two weeks. Everyone came to sprint planning meetings having looked ahead at their calendars and determined how much time they really had free to contribute to the team's work. Then we reviewed our pool of possible tickets to find the priorities and used the fun game of agile planning poker to reach consensus for how much time each ticket would need. Tickets were then assigned out based on who had the skills to do the work and who had time left in their two weeks of time to cover some or all of that project. We used daily standups as a way to check in on progress throughout the sprint. Everyone came together daily at a designated time to give a quick update on what they did yesterday, what they're going to do today, and any challenges they've encountered. These turned out to be both fun and beneficial. Everyone stayed aware of and engaged in the work of that sprint and were able to surface challenges, surface challenges and possible solutions together. At the end of the two weeks, we came together for a sprint review where we revisited all of the tickets that had been selected during sprint planning two weeks before. This generated a list of work completed and work in, pro work in progress but not yet finished that we could then send out via email to all our special collections colleagues as a status update on their requests and priorities. So altogether, this plan should have been a simple and effective formula, but we kept running into the same problem. 
Despite getting team consensus on how long each project should take, our actual time to complete projects was consistently not lining up with our estimates. And despite our best planning efforts, we never successfully completed everything we had planned to do in any given sprint. So we needed to figure out why this was happening in our daily practice when it wasn't surfacing in our planning. Overall, our metrics were showing that Agile was clearly enabling our unit to get more done in a better way, but it was also clear that something about our setup wasn't right and we needed to try a different approach. Talking through what was and wasn't working in my unit's Agile operation with Russell helped me expose and pinpoint our challenge points as well as determine what to try in a rebooted Agile setup. I definitely wanted to keep all of the things from Scrum that my unit had liked and found effective, but we needed to fix the problem of our plans not aligning with our end productivity. So from Scrum, we decided to keep two-week sprints. Planning and checking in on our progress as a team every two weeks was the right frequency. It allowed us to generally catch and fix small problems before they became big problems, identify trends and training needs at the point they emerged, and kept everyone aware of and engaged in overall individual and unit progress. Daily stand-ups. Similarly, starting the day with a general idea of where we were headed collectively and individually allowed us to make changes on short notice, problem solve together when something needed to be covered, and look for opportunities to collaborate on work that may otherwise have stayed siloed. And biweekly reporting out. This is good for us and good for our partners. The main change we made was transitioning our Agile operation from Scrum to Kanban. Through evaluating our challenges in the first 15 months of using Agile, Russell and I were able to identify that it is the very nature of archival work, the unpredictability of what's going to be in any box when you open it, that makes it challenging to effectively plan a timeline for every project before the project starts. And when this unpredictability was multiplied across the 50 or 60 tickets we had planned to work on in a sprint, it became clear why we were often only finishing sprints with 40 of those tickets done. When something unpredictable emerged, we either ended up spending more time on it than we had planned, which inevitably meant we didn't get to something else, or we had to set it aside until we could return to it later, which still meant it wasn't getting done. Over time, we were starting to lose track of what hadn't gotten done previously, and we didn't have a mechanism built into our Agile setup to effectively bring those previous projects back into our work. Fortunately, Kanban is meant to address these specific types of challenges. So to our existing things from Scrum that we liked, we adopted some new things from Kanban. We kept sprints, but unlike in Scrum, Kanban does not put a box around the total number of tickets your team is committing to do in that two weeks. Because of the variability of our work, we needed to be able to instead plan to get as much done as ended up being possible, but concede that we can't really plan for the context of contents of a box until we can assess what's actually in it. Functional areas and project or queue boards in our queues in our JIRA boards. Instead of one big queue of all of our tickets, we set up a separate Kanban board for each type, and then per the Kanban guidelines, organized our tickets for that board in priority order. Kanban dictates that the task at the top of the queue is always the task worked on next, which we had not followed as faithfully in Scrum as we really needed to. Additionally, each board was assigned to one staff member to lead. They became the person responsible for organizing priorities in that specific area owning assigning the prioritized work to make sure whatever needed to be done during that sprint got assigned out, and knowing when priorities in any one area were flexible enough to be deferred to higher priorities coming out of a different area. They also owned quality control for finished projects from their board, and more on that in a minute. In this setup, anyone could still work on a ticket from any board if their skills and time aligned, but shared leadership and participatory decision-making, also focuses of Kanban, were emphasized. Work in progress limits. Our biggest change was introducing limits to the number of projects that could be in progress at any given time. Work in progress limits mean that once a ticket is started, it has to be worked on until it is either done or blocked by something externally that your team can't control. This seems like a simple concept, but when we had to stay committed to what we started until it was done and didn't get in a continual cycle of starting new projects every time we hit a roadblock, like waiting for one of our colleagues in special collections to answer a question for us, or waiting for new archival supplies to come in, we started to get more things done. This is the Kanban traffic concept of slowing down to speed up, which Russell really advocated for us to try, and which I was skeptical about the practicality of until I saw in practice that that's exactly what happened. And block. So keeping track of what we couldn't do and why was revolutionary for us. 
This allowed us to build mechanisms into our workflows to address blockages and improved our ability to communicate out about what we weren't working on and why. Through this process, we found we were no longer losing track of anything, even when we did not, even when we did need to set that work aside. So I want to quickly highlight one aspect of Agile that has been essential to our unit's success. Emphasis on the quality control or quality assurance phase of the workflow. QC was already part of our workflows before my unit started using Agile and was part of the Scrum setup we initially used. But in Kanban, the role of QC is really emphasized. Altogether, QC is time well spent. The detail-oriented nature of archival technical services work means that errors are going to happen. No one can catch all of their own mistakes, typos, and other archival theory errors every time. But our special collections colleagues and patrons are relying on the finished products our unit works on to be error-free. In our existing workflows that we brought to Agile, and in our time doing Agile following Scrum, all QC work all QC was done by the supervisor for that work. This created an endless bottleneck and was further interfering with our unit's ability to accurately plan sprints because when a project needed to be returned from QC for follow-up work, we had not planned for the time to do that. In Kanban, QC is a collaborative process where the team collectively owns the quality of the finished work. So we introduced a multi-level QC process into our work that now starts with all projects being QC'd by one or more peers and then going to a supervisor for final QC. Admittedly, this was a bit awkward for, at first for the team. Having your peers review your work and give you feedback and having to do the same for them was not a comfortable experience for everyone at first. But once we got going with this as just a routine part of our workflows, the benefits and values for the team became clear to everyone. Everyone understood that they were going to make some mistakes and that catching them was not about personal evaluation of your ability to do the work, but rather about helping you catch those last few things you were no longer seeing in your own work, but that someone who was looking with fresh eyes could spot immediately. What started out as awkwardness quickly transitioned to trust. QCing as a team grows the team investment in collaboratively delivering the best final product that the team can produce. But more importantly, to be able to provide and receive effective feedback, everyone had to be increasingly committed to growing their own archival skills. Learning and growing together has continuously enabled staff in our unit to return to their own projects with deeper and broader archival knowledge. And this investment in QC and skill building has incrementally meant that over time, more work is making it to QC with fewer things that need to be reviewed and followed up on. We are also routinely receiving fewer requests for corrections and updates from our colleagues in special collections, which means we're recapturing more time to spend on the next tickets up in the queue. So our, Q, our QC process might not be a fit for everyone, but it's the greatest collective benefit our unit has gotten out of using Agile. And so I do encourage you, if you take nothing else from our presentation or otherwise don't see Agile as a strong fit for you, to consider whether there are opportunities to improve your own QC processes, as it is almost certain you'll find benefits from doing so. Okay, so I'm sure you're all curious, like what about the tool? So I'm here to talk about some of the tools. Um, when we've talked about different boards, uh, we're basically talking about different ways to segment and follow the progress of your work. In application development, we have a project board and a maintenance board. In archival description, they have accessioning, processing, backlog boards that come and go as they're needed. We use software, but you could also use a whiteboard and post-its or a bulletin board. In fact, those are the best way to get started with prototyping and documenting your workflows. We use it, <clears throat> excuse me, we use it last in Jira software to track our issues in both in application development and in archival description. This gives us a lot of flexibility in tracking progress, reporting out, organizing tasks, and tracking requests. There are many other software options, including Pivotal Tracker, Active Collab, Open Project. I mean, there's a new one practically every day. So one of the important reasons that we use software though is to track our progress is the scale of our backlogs. Each of our groups has thousands of tasks that we're keeping track of, and this really doesn't scale with Post-it. So what were really some of the bigger picture results of our implementation of Agile? Um, the article description and access was getting more done, but most importantly, Individual projects were reaching the finish line much more quickly, and over time, more and more of them were getting done. In addition, we are making better decisions about what work 
that we were doing, so making the most effective use of our limited staff resources. Um, it was very clear within the unit what the decisions were about what was being made, and we we're also trying to make it more obvious to our partner units about what was being worked on, why we were doing it, and how to affect the prioritization. Of course, this continues to be a work in progress. Communication was also vital. We um, initially started with that two-week sprint report that went out to a special collections group. Other people around the libraries uh, found out about that email and expressed a lot of interest. So now we do more periodic reports out to a wider range of stakeholders, including the history librarian, our colleagues in preservation and digitization, the IT to administrators, and we get many follow-up questions or expressions of, um, you know, it was great that this collection was processed because it turned out I could use it in instruction, not necessarily directly related to special collections. So we feel like that is definitely a big win. Um, the special collections units um, hopefully gained a clear understanding of what is being done. We have clearly demonstrated improved productivity and understanding of the range of activities and priorities across all the units. We continue to work on balancing all the different requests and needs to um, have the best understood outcomes. Thinking more about it as um, a mid-level administrator, the for myself, the results of Agile have been critical in making more realistic projections about what needs to be done and what it will take to get there. This has been the foundation for successful requests for staff positions, both term and regular, that without clear data would have been much more difficult to make. I can demonstrate concrete outcomes where differing expertise is being used collaboratively to make progress towards our aspirational future states. Um, and the progress we have made is not only within the unit, but across the library in reducing duplicative work. Within the big picture of the libraries, this work aligns with the strategic directions of the libraries. In particular, we have um, the, these four main pillars of um, outward-facing work. Empowering knowledge creators includes leveraging distinctive collections for use, and all the progress that we have made in describing and making available collections falls under this category. Modeling excellence is about how we do our work, and organizational efficiency and impact is an area where this project very closely aligns. Our work has been recognized through the library's process of identifying and assessing strategic initiatives. And this is important because it's recognizing work that is not directly user facing as significant to the success of the institution. All initiatives go through a review process by the management committee of OSUL. And this initiative was kind of given um, a, a strong review such that is really now considered to be an essentially integrated component of our program. So I want to give a recap from the technical service archivist perspective. Uh, archivist, is Agile worth it for you to investigate? So Agile is flexible. What works for us at OSU Libraries may not work for you, but there's no one way there is no one right way to use Agile in Archival Technical Services, but the great thing about Agile is that there's no one right, one right way to do it in general. It's right for you when it fits what you need it to do. One, operation, one observation from our experiences is that in Archival Technical Services work, Scrum is probably better if you have fewer variables or otherwise more predictability in your work. Kanban is probably better if you have a complex environment. Additionally, we do use Agile to run everything our unit does, but Agile is scalable. You can easily scale it down to just one area or of work or even just one project. We use Agile in a team setting, but Agile doesn't have to be for a team. It's still an effective tool for tracking, prioritizing, and managing projects in a solo setting. The benefit of using Agile as a team is that it forces the team to work as a team, which is mostly a good thing. Agile brings something to the table for everyone involved. For your folks who are planners, organizers, communicators, decision makers, those who have trouble keeping track of things, those who just like to know what's going on, your partners and colleagues, et cetera. Overall, Agile is a pretty good tool for improving transparency and communication in your unit and your organization, which are also wins for most people. Agile is easy to learn. You certainly can dive deeply into Agile, but with a read of the introductory resources we've provided links to here, 
you can quickly learn enough to begin using Agile. Using Agile does require a mind shift. Basically, you have to remember to do things like make tickets for your work and not start something new until it comes to the top of the priority queue. But when it's built around what you're already doing, the fit is natural. As an anecdotal point of reference here, it only took staff in our unit about 30 days to get comfortable, used to and comfortable with using Agile. So even with our challenges in the scrum phase of Agile, bringing Agile into our unit yielded a drastic increase in efficiency and output. Within six months of adopting Agile, our output of finished products had doubled, despite our base workload also increasing at the same time. With our transition to Kanban, productivity is even higher. As an anecdotal point of reference here, collectively across the two and a half years our unit has been using Agile, we have brought over 2,500 new collections to patrons through the support Agile provided to our existing workflows. Agile has allowed our unit to maintain productivity, maintain productivity despite changes in staffing. There is no work not being done because the position is vacant. And when someone new joins the team, they're never the only one doing something, so their area of work isn't lagging while they're getting up to speed. Certainly, our overall capacity of how much work we can do in a given month does increase and decrease with the number of FTE we have available to do the work, but our use of Agile ensures that whatever current FTE we're at is being spent on whatever is currently the highest priority, which is ultimately what our special collections colleagues and patrons are after. And so for our unit, the bottom line is this. Agile has improved our unit operations so dramatically that we could not go back to a traditional archival staffing model and maintain the same productivity, transparency, et cetera, that we currently have, and that we need to provide for our colleagues in special collections. As a unit, archival description and access can do our best work when we know how it's going to interact with the archival web environment IT builds and maintains for us. Making an intentional effort to create a shared space where archivists and developers can have a, product, can have a productive conversation about each other's priorities really supports this. We don't have to know how to do each other's jobs, but we do need to understand the products and goals of each other's work. Additionally, having partners to talk about Agile with is really valuable. We are continuously learning from each other's very different Agile setups and turning that shared knowledge into incremental improvements for each of our own Agile environments. So to do this, we had to take the time to talk about our projects together and the not projects, the pain points that each of our teams were having. It's a big investment, but it really is an investment. And, and after this, together we can do complex projects. Our teams had to work closely to develop our amalgamated collection experience. The ACE project is an improved presentation of archival description that integrates content from digital collections, the catalog, and more places. The implementation of ACE wouldn't even have been apparent without the long-standing relationship that we developed. So demonstrating how productivity in the archival description and access unit has changed since we brought Agile into all of our work two and a half years ago is difficult to do in a single image. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, staffing in our unit has been and continues to be in flux. At this time last year, the unit had nine staff. As of, as of September this year, we have three. In the past year, the total number of tickets we have completed has varied by month due to staffing and due also to some months being dedicated to fewer large projects and others to more smaller projects. However, in every month, we've turned around at least 20 tickets. These represent the priorities identified by our special collections colleagues and are a combination of collections accessioned, processed, pulled from the legacy backlogs and exposed to patrons for the first time through new description, et cetera. As you can see, in most months, we are getting quite a bit more work done than we are adding to our queues. We still have years more to go before the unit is able to eliminate all of the legacy backlogs we inherited and ongoing changes in things like staffing FTE will always impact what our total capacity is at any given time. But we can demonstrate that regardless of what changes around us from month to month, our use of Agile to complete archival technical services work is facilitating efficient and effective workflows that allow us to complete work prioritized by our special collections colleagues while also making real progress on our backlog. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, say thank you to uh, Morag, Kate, Russell for sharing about your experiences. It's uh, been fascinating to hear how you have uh, implemented that there at um, OSU Libraries. Um, we're opening up the floor 
to questions, uh, again, for all of our attendees. Um, I'll give you all a moment to uh, enter some comments into chat. We've had just a few things come in, so I wanted to um, uh, verbalize those so folks can hear uh, some of the contributions here. Uh, so Cindy Sheen, I hope you're pronouncing your last name correctly, um, has shared a presentation at SAA um, about, um, about um, their use of the Agile project uh, management methods. So it uh, looks like there's a really useful uh, resource there and an article. Um, so there are links. So thank you, Cindy, for sharing those. And then, um, yeah, um, you know, she, uh, she has shared that um, although they're, they're smaller, the Agile principles really do apply. So I think that's a, a good validation of it being flexible, uh, regardless of size. Um, and then looks like um, uh, Linda Ballinger has mentioned that they'll also be um, applying Agile. Uh, they've been focused on Scrum practices, but we'll now look more at Kanban. So it's thank you uh, for sharing those who are uh, uh, putting those into use. Uh, would be well, uh, I'll give you all a little more of an opportunity to enter some questions into chat if you have some questions for our panelists um, while I give uh, you all a little bit more of a chance to think about your questions. Um, I wanted to ask the panelists, you know, I, I think this is, it's really impressive to see the, um, just the sheer amount of collaboration and um, uh, productivity that's come from implementing this way of working. Um, but it's easy to say that now in retrospect, and I'd be curious, as you are looking to um, really shift to agile methods and really bringing the team on, um, that, that part of getting started seems like perhaps one of the hardest things to do. So I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about how did you approach the concept of getting started, getting team buy-in, uh, making sure that you know, everybody's all in, and, and it was clear that your first attempt wasn't exactly uh, what you wanted it to be, so there was some reiterating on that and, and a shift to Kanban. So that question about buy-in and how you kept people motivated and interested, even as there was clearly some, um, some weaknesses that, that had to be addressed and improved on. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about what worked for you all to really make sure uh, that you were setting yourselves up for success when you still didn't quite know how it might go. So I think what was critical for us early on was to approach this uh, as, as something that we didn't know how it was going to go. Um, so we had, I'd spent a lot of time talking with Russell, with Morag for probably about three months before we started even trying to do anything. Um, talking about various scenarios, various things we wanted to try and trying to figure out how could we get the best start under us um, and then when we did, so when we did start, we did do training. Russell came in and spent a day teaching us what Agile was and how to use it and talking about how they were using it in their department because their department has been using it for a while. Um, from there, we then dedicated the first two months as a trial phase um, just to throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what was going to stick. Um, we did, within my unit, I made a, a pretty conscious effort to make sure a lot of time was carved out to spend on training, going over um, what are the practices, what are the changes and what you need to do, how do you use the software, um, you know, when, when it's, how do you know when it's the next person's turn to do something, like how are we going to do all these things, remembering to come to the daily stand up, uh, check in and doing all of the things that we wanted to turn into um, the habit and routine for how we're doing our work. Um, we also made, so we, we made sure that all of our colleagues um, in the special collections units that we were very clear and upfront with them before we started this, that this is what we were going to be doing, um, and that we did not know going into it if it was going to be uh, beneficial for us. We didn't know if it was going to increase our productivity or if it was going to uh, send us down a further backlog spiral. Um, so we wanted to be very upfront that we were going to try this. We could not promise or guarantee how it was going to work out. Um, that we hoped for good things, but that they needed to hang in there with us. Um, for the team, there was, a, other than getting past the initial early, like, what is this and how do I know what I'm supposed to do, 
there was a lot of interest in doing something like this. Um, the workloads and responsibilities for the unit are huge, and the queues are huge, and everybody was mutually struggling with just trying to keep track of what is the most important thing that I need to do today? How do I know? Um, and we had been trying to deal with also just the workflow habit of you would start working on something and then somebody would walk into the room and put something else on your desk and now tell you that that was the most important thing that they needed done. And that constant interruption in our work and sort of the on the fly reprioritization was really uh, derailing our work. So having this in place, um, Agile gave us a way to say no to things like that or to be able to say no in a way that our colleagues started to understand why we were saying no. Uh, so I will say this didn't just come together in a couple of weeks. We had to practice and work at it for a while. But by the time we got through the end of that like two month trial phase, we had learned enough about kind of how to do it that we could operationalize it. And from there, we just needed to learn through that first, you know, roughly 15 months, how, what's not working and how do we do this better? And I would say that because so many of our um, team members are, were early career professionals, they were pretty open to trying something new. So I think that was um, helpful. And now as we bring new people on, really starting in the interview process, we're really talking to them about how we do our work so they have a good understanding of that coming in to the team. I, I would also say that um, one of the things that I noted from, um, from my point of view was um, the team, as they implemented, focusing on what, what the, the things that were working on, that were working for them and what, what the benefits were was, was actually, that's the sort of thing that makes a, an implementation like this go really well is when you have that, that positive, you know, certainly there was some struggle, but it was like people were like, oh, okay, well, this isn't working, but I do know, I can see where all my tickets are and I can see, I might not be able to, you know, choose which one's most important, but I can see all of them. And, and it's that kind of incremental improvement, which, um, you know, even, even, even in the middle of an implementation, uh, was it, they could see the value of it. And so I think that uh, encouraged them to continue on that journey. Thank you. Those, uh, that additional information about what you invested at the front end, um, how to help uh, bring people on board, and um, uh, you know, trying. To, I, I think the key of uh, really viewing this as a pilot and exploring together uh, to really try to improve uh, current workflows. Um, I think that was clearly a, an important aspect of that. So uh, thanks for sharing some of those those steps and tips in terms of, of how to get started. Um, uh, we've had a few uh, additional resources and links uh, popped into chat. So it uh, looks like there's some really great uh, reading and additional information on this for uh, people who want to get started. And then we uh, merrily posed the question of what, what are some of the things that might be uh, barriers or blockers to people trying to implement this at their institutions. Um, and so while we've we've got you as a as a panelist uh, with some expertise on this, I, I don't know if there's some any additional thoughts or or hints that uh, you you might have um, tips you could give folks. Um, so somebody shared, we do not have a single staff member uh, dedicated to arrangement and description. It's done by student assistants. Um, and so just trying to wrap our heads around how this sort of process would be possible with staff uh, who are working part-time anywhere from 8 to 20 hours per week and never quite at the same time. Um, yeah, so it sounds like finding that, that together stand-up time would be difficult. I don't know if, um, if, if any of you all have any thoughts or suggestions around that situation. Uh, sure. So finding the time to have a daily stand-up when everybody is not even there on the same day would be a challenge. But we have um, our student assistants and our interns are part of all of, all of our things that we do um, in the process. So we assign tickets to our students. Um, so the way that we do this is to really look at what is the work that needs to get done and is it a project that should just be done by one person or how, if not, how can we break it apart? So. I um, have 
sort of a philosophy in my department that there is almost nothing that we're doing that there isn't a student component of it in there somewhere. And so the thing that I'm always challenging uh, folks in my team to think about is to find the student component of every project. Um, so this makes sure that staff are spending the right, the, their time on things that really are like staff level work and not, you know, sort of having it uh, wasted away by doing the things that could be handed off to a student, even if it might feel like it's easier just to do it yourself. Um, because we have limited time. But so we really have made an effort to find the student work in everything that we're doing, and then we assign it to our students. And uh, that is just part of our regular workflows. And the fact that I mean, our students are never all there at the same time either, so they don't get, don't get to participate in the stand-ups, but they are part of the workflow. Um, they don't, they're not necessarily involved in all phases of it. Like they don't come to our planning meetings, but what we plan in our meetings plans work that's going to go to our students what we review with our students' work, and we do involve their work going back and forth in the QC process. So I think it's in terms of scale, it's about finding the place where your where your students or your part-time folks can fit into it, um, with understanding that they might not be able to do all of the parts of it. Thanks, Kate. It's it's really helpful to to hear that uh, added aspect of how uh, students and and part-time uh, workers would would fit into that. And so uh, that's. Uh, really valuable to hear. Um, where are, uh, I would just quickly add that for both Kate's team and Russell's team, um, they don't always have to be physically present. We do a lot with, you know, uh, virtual participation and stand-ups. Yeah, and my team actually doesn't all even work in the same building together. So we have, we being in the same place does not necessarily prohibit the ability to implement these practices. Yeah, we slack. Um, we have remote days. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have a couple of remote days. And we have people that are um, work remotely. Um, so we have our stand up there are in Slack. Um, so you know, a, any you know chat system would work like that. We used to use HipChat, something before that. Um, but just kind of like it's it's the idea of the communication that that you know, um, and and and. The stand-up is just one of those, uh, I, I would call it an artifact, um, and, it, and it's important not to get hung up on um, some of these artifacts. Well, we can't all be there in the same place where it's not going to use for us, but um, on the other hand, having that ticket system uh, makes it easy so you can track what those 20 students are doing at any given time. You can see where all of those tasks are uh, when they're assigned to those people, so I would strongly uh, recommend if you have a large, what I call transient student uh, student work pool, then I would definitely recommend some sort of ticketing system, um, and you know just try Kanban uh, for organizing those tickets. Thank you. I'd be I'd be curious to hear ongoing. Um, of ongoing professional development around this. So, Morag, you had uh, mentioned how as you bring new staff in, you introduce the, the way of working, the agile way of working to them, and so that they're incorporated into that. Uh, but do they receive some formal agile training, or is there anything as a team that you're continuing to do to make sure that you're uh, sustaining, um, you know, the agile work methods and, and continuing to uh, not only sustain the, the success that you're seeing, but um, maybe continuing to iterate where there are opportunities for improvement? So I'm thinking here about, um, we do this, I think, at a lot of different levels, some informal, some more formal, and a more formal thing was actually where Kate and one of the other like board leaders in her unit went with some people from our IT department to like an actual agile training program and that was successful. I don't know what you two want to add about that. Yeah, I mean, we went to, so this was at the point where uh, we were getting, we sort of were a year into Scrum. It was mostly working for us, but not, something was off and there was an opportunity to go to training on Kanban. And it was really, it was going through, through the process of going to that training and going to it with our colleagues in another department here in the libraries who are also using Agile um, to learn not about just what Kanban can look like in software development, but what does the concepts mean and being able to like talk to them around common library language about how can we translate that. 
that was sort of the breakthrough for us that helped us to understand like, okay, Scrum wasn't really working. Kanban sounded like it might, but here's how we understand how it's going to work. So that was the most formal thing that we did. Um, in terms of sort of ongoing, I mean, I think our unit and uh, Russell's unit continue to have regular sort of formal and informal planned times to get together to, to just share what we're learning and uh, look for opportunities to go in new directions. And then within my unit, um, pretty much everything we're doing agile-wise has been folded into everything we're just doing archival-wise. So when we train anybody on anything at any time, they're getting both things together at once. So we don't really, I mean, I will sit down and like show them how to use the software to make sure that that isn't a hang up for them. But I don't really separate out the agile part from the archival part. It just all is one common thing at this point. And so as folks are coming into our unit, um, it's just, it just happens naturally for them. There isn't the need to sort of have them sit back and like read an agile manual before they're going to be able to understand what the unit is doing. So, yeah. oh. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I would just add that uh, it, you know, uh, as, as one of those barriers to entry, um, I, I, I would recommend that you don't necessarily. Everyone on the team does not absolutely does not need to be an agile expert, um, and, and it and it really does come down to folding it into your to your work. Um, you know, when you're when you're doing an implementation, you kind of need someone to lead the group and this is how we're going to do it, and this is this is what you need to do as a person. Um, but to, to kind of, you, you don't need someone to be a certified agile practitioner or something like that to, to, to be uh, one of the team members. It, it's not bad to have training for the person who is you know, developing the workflow and implementing the workflow. Um, that's actually really valuable, um, and that's one of the things that made us successful is uh, Actually, getting the training for the people implementing it. So, um, with me uh, getting me trained up was good. <laughs> um, so, I guess I would say, don't think that you have to send everyone in everyone, all 20 people, or all five people, or all two people. Two people, you probably need both of them to go to training, but you don't need all 20 people to go to training. And also, order lunch and play games. <laughs> yes. And, and that, I think, might be a great way to wrap up today's presentation. Um, I will just echo uh, Cindy's comments here in chat uh, about how inspiring um, your talk has been. So it's been, uh, thank you for generously sharing your experiences with us and uh, telling us more about how you've implemented it. So um, thanks again uh, for our panelists. Um, and for our attendees, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for sharing resources and comments and sharing about your experiences. We appreciate your um, attendance at today's webinar. Uh, we'll post a recording of this webinar online, and I'll notify you by email when the recording is available. Uh, this concludes today's webinar.